I read the gospel reading first or the epistle read? <laughs> okay. The epistle reading is from 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to wait. Verse 1 to 2 and I, I don't know. We declare to you Okay. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the world of life. The life this life was revealed, and we have seen it and, and to test and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are taking in the darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just forgive us our, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his world is not in us. My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The gospel reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were looked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he, when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Who's going to pray for the preacher this morning? Thank you, Miss Toby. Please pray with me. Lord, as we come to you today in this house of joy, on a day that is as beautiful as it could possibly be, we thank you for all that you have gifted to us. We pray today that you will be with Pastor Terry as she delivers her message. Help us to understand that the words that she says will fall upon each of our hearts in a different way so that we can relate and we can understand. Help us to know you better through her words. Lord, be with her as she continues to strive to be all that she can be. 
In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. There was a little boy who was afraid of thunderstorms. Anybody relate to that? My dog is afraid of thunderstorms. My bet the other night after she went out in the water in the backyard was pretty deep. She came in, it looks like a stampede of horses and cattle ran through my bed. There are little muddy footprints everywhere. But this little boy was afraid, He's seven years old, and he said he, the boom happened. And his father was trying to break him and get in bed with he and his mom. And he runs down the hall, he says, Daddy, Daddy, can I get in bed with you, please? I'm so scared. He says, go back to bed, God is with you. Boom, another big bolt of lightning strikes and the thunder follows and the little boy runs and says, Daddy, please let me get in bed with you and Mom. Please, please, please. He says, no, go back in bed. Dad wants you to go back to bed because God is with you. Just think God is with me. The boy is going down the hall going, God is with me, God is with me, God is with me. Boom. The boy runs down the hall and says, Daddy, please let me get in bed with you and Mom. And he said, I told you, God is with you. The little boy says, I know God is with me, but sometimes I need God with skin on. <laughs> think about that. You need something you can touch and see that God is there with you. That's what we're talking about here this morning, the God that we can touch and see. Where do you see God? Where do you see Jesus? I want you to answer. That's not a rhetorical question. Where do you see Jesus? What? In the sunlight, amen. Because it says, in him there is no darkness at all. God is light. Where else do you see Christ? The loving and caring of other people. Amen. The loving and caring of other people. When people are forgiving, when people are gracious, when people are kind, people love one another. You see Christ very, very, very clearly. Where else do you see Christ? In a baby. In a baby. Yep. In our little kids, we see Christ. Years ago, when I served at Trinity Church in Frederick, we built a house in the chancel. Oh my goodness gracious, we built a whole house in the chancel. It was a big chancel. And um, we built a house that went home with the builder who was a contractor. He was building a playhouse for his kids, and we had him do it in the chancel. And he hammered during worship. Oh, my goodness. People got upset. Why are we doing this ridiculous thing? Why are we doing this ridiculous thing? It was just the first week. We only hammered during hymns, not during the choir anthem, but during the hymns. And when things were just raucous anyway, we hammered. We did not hammer during prayers or didn't hammer during the sermon or the scripture reading, but people said, I don't want this silly stuff in here. Why are we doing this? That was the only week we did that. The rest of the weeks, it was about a month that we had the house up there. Every time people came in, there was more of the house ready. The last Sunday, I had all the kids come up, and there were a lot of kids in that congregation. They all went in the house, and they were looking at it, and they were so excited. And I said, why don't we do something this silly, like build a house? And this little hand went up and said, because people need houses to live in. We're raising money for mission. And I said, what would you do if you met somebody who lived in a box on the street? And they all said the same thing. What do the little kids say when you say, what do you do if somebody has no home? What do they say? Bring them home with you. They don't say build them a house. They say bring them home and let them live with you. That is Christ. That is compassion. That is grace. That is peace. That is all the things that we're called to be in Christ's name. We're not going to beat up on poor Thomas today. I think he gets a bad rap, doesn't he? The other disciples are there and Jesus just shows up and says, okay, I'm here. And they say, okay. And he says, breathes the spirit into them. It's a little Pentecost, people. What happens when the spirit is in you? You're supposed to be out in the world, right? Sharing Christ. What are they doing? They're still hiding another week later. Thomas comes in and they say, we've seen the Lord. And they said, what did he say? Unless I do what? Clark had the right answer. What did you say, Clark, up here? had to touch his wounds, not just see him, he had to touch his wounds to know that he was there. Jesus comes and says, here, Thomas, touch me. Touch me. Know that it's me. And Thomas says the most important line he'll ever say in his life, my Lord and my God. Jesus was very human. He had skin on, didn't he? It's God with skin. God who came to earth to know exactly what we know and what we experience. Jesus experienced every human emotion. Joy, laughter, love. But he also experienced pain, abandonment, isolation. He was hanging on the cross saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's how low he got at that point. But he experienced everything we experienced, but yet was without sin, so that he might take our sin upon himself. Pretty big deal, huh? Well, what are we going to do with this passage from 
1 John. Now let me tell you, you want a, want a dad joke this morning? Do we have any dads here who could use a good dad joke? How do you know that God loves baseball? Anybody's heard this one before? Because the story begins in the beginning. In the big inning. You had a groan at that. That's bad. That's really bad. But how does John's gospel begin? Here's your Bible quiz du jour. How does John's gospel? We didn't read it this morning, but how does it begin? Jackie, you know it? In the beginning? What's the word? The word was with God. The word was God. Now we have John's epistle. We're not sure if it was the same John or not, but what does he say? We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The word of life, and that was the light. No darkness can overcome. Just like John's gospel, John's epistle begins the same way, within the beginning. Just like the story of creation begins in the beginning. Christ, who is here with us before anything was made. Christ, who is God. This is called high Christology, if you want it in seminary terms. Talking about who Christ is for us. That he is the son of God. He's the very presence of God in our lives. The God with skin on that we can see and touch and feel and be with. When he breathes on the disciples, what does he say to them? Peace be with you. That's like saying salvation be with you. Shalom be with you. Wholeness, completeness, joy be with you. Everything be with you. They still don't get it yet. But the best Easter sermon I ever heard was preached by Ken Green, who died quite a few years ago now. He said in a sermon to his clergy brothers and sisters, what an audacious thing to do to preach in front of all the clergy in the conference. I would hate to do that. But he preached and he said, God did not move the stone so that Jesus could get out. God moved the stone so we could see in. Think about that in a minute. Jesus did not need that stone to be moved. He could get out of that tomb all by himself. How do we know that? Because he got into a locked room all by himself, without any help from anybody. And they still didn't recognize him. The same disciples who had seen him raise the dead call Lazarus from his tomb. That's when Thomas has this great moment. We never remember his big moment. We remember his falling down moment. Because what did he say when Jesus said, we're going to go to Jerusalem? He said, Lord, we, the disciples said, we can't go there. They're going to kill you there. Thomas says, then let us go with him and die. That is a word of faith. Just like when he looks at him and says, my Lord and my God. There is no lock that can keep Jesus out. There is no stone that can hold him in. Amen? So here he is in their midst again, the light of the world coming into their darkness, and they don't quite recognize him. But that's why I want you to say, where do you see Jesus? Come on, let's get some more answers. Where do you see Jesus? Where do you see him? I see him in your faces. I see him in everyone here that I know. Everyone here I don't know, I see Christ in you because you're here to worship him. Give him praise, give him your lives, give him your work. Your... We saw Christ last night in the auction with people coming together to support a mission team. People who didn't even know us came from the community because they knew what we were doing and they came and they got some good stuff. They came and they shared in our fellowship and our fun. I see Christ in these young people here. I've told you before, Timonium United Methodist Church has no children left, not one kid, no Sunday school. We've got children here. We've got to nurture them and love them. Um, Palm Sunday went to church with my pal Lambert Corcoran, who used to be our music director. They had a changing table in the sanctuary. Maybe some of you are like, I don't know about that. But that's how welcoming they are of children. They have kids there. They had young adults there who felt comfortable bringing their kids that they weren't going to be laughed at or looked at or given the evil eye, the stink eye, as they call it. Everyone is welcome in this congregation, and it's, the building's falling down around their ears. They don't spend money on their building. They minister to people in their neighborhood in Baltimore City. It's a cool place to visit. So nobody said you see Christ in your mirror. Anybody see Christ when you look in the mirror? I don't some days. Jesus hides from me in my mirror some days. It's like, Terry, you know better than that, right? But you've got to see Christ in yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you are Christ. And I've got to say something here about Marjorie Taylor Greene posted something about Jesus being crucified the same week as Donald Trump is being crucified and that Donald Trump is the Savior that this nation needs. He is not the Savior. Jesus alone is Savior. Jesus alone is Lord. It's not a political statement. That's just a statement of fact. 
And Donald Trump is reposting these things about him being the savior of the world. The United States does not need a savior. We have a savior. We have a savior. His name is Jesus Christ who died for our sins. So when you look in the mirror, I want you to see Christ's reflection. I don't want you to see Jesus and think, I've got to take this all on myself. But you don't have to do that because Christ died so that we might have life eternal in his name. We don't need anybody else taking our, his place in our hearts. So please, if you hear that or if you see somebody say that, say, uh-uh. And if you voted for him and you have, if you're a Republican, and you know I'm not a Republican. Some people figured that one out a while ago. But if you are, tell him to stop it. Because he's not going to listen to me, but he listened to people who were going to vote for him. But tell him to stop doing that. Because seeing Christ in yourself is not saying you are Christ. It's not saying you're the savior of the world. It's saying that you are going to live your life forgiving and loving and showing grace to one another. That is what we're called to do in his name. Amen? You're offended. I'm sorry, but I had to say that. But I want you to see Christ in the world around you. I want you to see Christ in the sacrament, because this morning we get to touch Jesus. We get to take him into our bodies, which is why on the night before he died, he didn't think of himself. He thought of us. He thought of his disciples in every generation, and he said, take and eat. This is now my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins the sins of the whole world. The light of the world has come in to our darkness and we need to reflect that light. One Sunday for the children's sermon, I talked about reflecting the light and I gave everybody a mirror. I talked about the movie that I saw when I was a kid that I found out later was not true, but it was so cool. Mickey Rooney starring as the young Thomas Edison. Anybody ever see that one? His mother needed surgery before there was electricity in homes. But it was at night, and they said they didn't have enough light. They couldn't perform the surgery without killing his mother. She wasn't going to live till morning. So he broke into stores, he broke into neighbors' homes, and he took every mirror he could find, and he set them up around the room and had candles, and it reflected enough light. So we're called to be the mirrors that reflect Jesus Christ in the world, because his light can overcome any darkness. So this morning, when you come up to take communion, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the peace of God entering your heart because Christ is going to enter your body through this sacrament of his body and blood. I want you to say, my Lord and my God, when you receive that. This morning, instead of saying amen, when they say the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ given to you, I want you to say, my Lord and my God. And then I want you to go home and I want you to look at each other before you leave and say, I see Christ in you and we share the peace this morning. I want you to go home and look in the mirror and say, I want to see Jesus there, his reflection in my face, in my grace, in my love for others, in my ability to forgive, in my ability to love, because Christ will break your heart and make you love. He'll spill the love out to everybody you meet. You just have to let him in. So I hope you will remember, if anybody comes to you saying, I need you. Don't say God is with you. Say, climb in with me. And I will love you to wholeness in his name. Amen and amen and amen.